obviously a lot of people talking about uh, the book uh, White Fragility, which I believe was written about a year or two ago, but you know immediately became uh, this th this uh, very sought after book uh, after the killing of George Floyd, and and people talking about well discussing what's in there. What I found was really interesting was in that book. There's addressing this idea that um, white people have so much fear and sensitivity about race exactly. that we're afraid to make a mistake. And then you think about it and you think, well, a faux pas is a small price to pay for trying to engage. Meaning if the price that I'm gonna have to pay to educate myself and to grow and evolve is to be embarrassed a bunch of times, that is less than the size of an atom compared to the Himalayan mountains, which are hundreds of years of racial discrimination. So get over it. I think I encourage people to think of, well, what's the worst thing that can happen, right? right. If, you, if you put on a Black Lives Matter t-shirt or you put a sign in your window or mm -hmm. you take the step to bring something up to a family member and that's like, you know, might, might be uncomfortable or awkward or even really contentious. What's the worst thing that can happen and what are you willing to risk for something that you believe? Um, you know, and I think that what I want to encourage people to do is if, you know, is to get clear on your beliefs. If you believe uh, that we have a history of systemic racism in this country, if you believe that black and brown people are disproportionately mistreated by police, uh, if you believe these things, if you believe that Black Lives Matter, then you know what are you willing to risk to talk about that and to share that message with people in your community? In some ways, very simple, and yet clearly we talk about, there's the paralysis and fear that we see in this country about people worried to make a mistake. And then the flip side, what I want to ask you about is defensiveness. Yeah. It's a very simple thing to go, I don't know, maybe I did, maybe I did make a mistake. Maybe I was biased. Maybe, maybe uh, how could I not be biased? Let's talk about it. It's such a simple thing to do, but, but people put up this defensive wall. And it's that defensiveness, I think, is the hardest thing to get over. It is. And, you know, to what I like to, you know, I kind of like to turn it around and say, like, well, what exactly are you defending? You know, when you get that upset, um, because we've had this conversation and it's, that's the thing. It's not just about getting accused of doing something that is seen as racist. You know, people will be furious that you and I are actually having this conversation. Um, you know, so for those people, it's like, what, what are you so upset about? How is this harming you? What exactly are you defending? Um, are you just defending white supremacy? Are you defending, um, you know, uh, that that position? Um, right. Yeah, it's it's the defensiveness is huge, and I, I you know, I, I really appreciate, um, you know, you. I appreciate you having me on, and I appreciate you being willing to have this conversation after the fact, right? Because I think that in all these conversations that we have about what white people can be doing and be better and all this stuff, I think accountability and follow-up is a huge part of it, right? So we can have these conversations in the weeks after these horrific things happen, but then we kind of go back to normal, right? Yeah, I, I was gonna show, um, like, I don't have it as a, but I was gonna hold up my phone and say, we are very much uh, a society that's like, what are we talking about now? Mm -hmm. So uh, right now it's Trump's getting impeached and that's all anybody wants to talk about and then we move on and then it's COVID and then we move on and then George Floyd is killed and uh, everybody says, this is now what we're gonna talk about. And you think this is fantastic. And it's not that people are consciously saying, dismissing it as an issue, but then COVID resurges and we move on. And then that is, I think the issue is so much good or dialogue, so much good dialogue and so much raw emotion was vented in the last two months that you think let's, a, a sort of a path has been opened. I don't think we've ever seen sustained mm -hmm. anger and concern like that in my lifetime. Yeah. Um, I'm 28. Yeah, uh, I know. You're, you're a lot younger than me, so. Yeah, yeah, I just, it's sun damage. Um, <laughs> but, we haven't seen this and yeah, this is a, an opportunity to keep the path open and keep exploring. So you're right. I mean, I, I, I do think it's essential to not say, well, 
check. Mm -hmm. We did racism. Yeah, right. We pulled, down, we pulled down a bunch of statues, and um, I think we're good. Let's yeah. move on because yeah. we haven't moved on. You know, the Breonna Taylor's killers are still uh, still walking free, and um, there's still people in in Louisville who've been protesting every single day for months, getting arrested and and not relenting. And so, you know, I think sometimes what happens too is that for especially with you know white people, if it's not immediately in your feed and in your immediate in front of your face in your feed then you think oh it's not it doesn't exist anymore so i think uh you know the the level at which we saw the kind of protests happening all over all the time constantly um that's still happening in a lot of places um it just might not be showing up in your feed so um you know be sure to be diversifying your feed and paying attention to it because it's all still happening but i think you're right that there is a path that's open and this is a time for people to really be thinking critically about how do you stay on that path? Now, it doesn't mean that everything you do now has to be completely uh, you know, all about racial justice, unless that's the work that you really wanna be doing. I've been watching everybody you've had on and you've had great people on that I love, and you've had some incredible conversations with your black guests that you've had on. But what happens when Will Ferrell comes on? I love Will. You know, What does it look like when in addition to his new movie, you also say, hey, like, how are you feeling about you know, the changes in society? What, how right. did the how'd the killing of George Floyd affect you, you know, Will or Rob Lowe or whatever person's on? Um, right. And that's where there's like a real, that's unexpected. And I think that's where the, the needle starts to get moved, you know, and it's goes back to that idea about discomfort. Like that's, white people do not expect to be asked about race <laughs> because we don't right. see ourselves as part of race. We often see racism as something that happens to other people who do not look like us and, we didn't do it, right? But we are actually totally complicit and right. white supremacy uh, impacts us all negatively, so. No, I, I mean, I think that's a really good point. I think it's, what's interesting about it is the concept that when you're, when you're talking to people, and this is something where I honestly don't know the answer, but where I'm talking to people in entertainment about their project is then figuring out a way to do it which doesn't look like a gotcha, doesn't look like um, I've, you know, uh, and, and also asking them, they may have very visceral, strong feelings about it and they may not be prepared to talk about that. So there needs to be a way to figure out how can I, how, how can that be part of the conversation ongoing without it looking like I'm trying to make people uncomfortable? Do you know what I mean? Yeah, but you always are kind of making people uncomfortable, you know. That's just my appearance. Yeah, that's, that's, that's true. That's, <laughs> I can't do anything about that. No, I can't believe we've been having to look at this for so long. The um, thin lips and the eyes and, uh, yeah. No, but I, I, I agree that, um, that there needs to be many different ways. Like, one of the approaches that... I've wanted to take is how can I, not even so much as a person with whatever kind of platform I have, I'm always wary of my platform because sure. I think my, my, and I think I should be wary of my platform because I'm not even comfortable with the word. I, I feel like I'm someone who has some ability at being silly and that has brought me into people's homes for a long period of time. And so I'm wary of leaning against it like the most important thing to me has been how do I personally, how do I evolve? How do I change the culture that's my ecosystem around me? How can I improve it? How can I make changes that, and, and sort of lead by example? Does that make sense? It makes perfect sense. You know, taking inventory of, of who's working for you. You know, by the way, everybody you work with that I've interacted with so far has been the nicest people ever. So Good job, love them all. Um, I've, I've tried to fire them, but they have legal protections, uh, which infuriates me, you know? The labor movement. Uh, what, I no. really want, what I really want is a staff of shitheads, but I <laughs> legally don't know how to, how to pull it off. I don't know how to do it. Um, I'm, I'm sure you could find a lawyer who could help you figure that one out. Um, yeah. No, I think that, you know, like whether it's looking around at who are you employing, who are you working with, who are you hiring, what does your writing room look like, you know, who are you bringing in, and what does yep. it look like to be yep. intentional about that, you know, but, um, but I wanted to say to the idea of how do you bring up those conversations in ways that don't feel like a gotcha, you know, I, again, I think black entertainers have been they're, that's what they do. I watched the wonderful Nicole Byer when you had her on. She's hilarious. And she talked both about the pain 
and the challenge of this moment. And she also talked about her amazing new book. You know, she, so what's uh, uh, great is when I, I, I love, so many people are, we have a, a writer on our staff, Lori Kilmartin, who's very good at talking about, she just lost her mother to COVID and she was able to take that pain and, and, and braid it, entwine it with humor in this way that was like a razor's edge. Yeah. And I think uh, Chris Redd from Saturday Night Live was on and he was, um, you know, he's, he can be so funny where he's walking the razor's edge of, he, he can bring up being afraid of hearing someone be racist when he's playing a video game and they don't know who he is and maybe someone's gonna, you know, shout out the N word uh, and and not know that he's there. But he was very funny talking about that in a way that it's such a powerful weapon to be funny and bring up the biggest nuclear bomb issue in American history for the last 250 years wow. and somehow combine the two. Those, I mean, it's so many entertainers are so good at doing that. Um, and I think that's a very powerful tool as well. And I think that's, you know, that's what I've always loved about Kamau and his work is how he does, you know, yeah, comedy is an incredibly powerful tool and uh, you can, you know, you can do so much. You can go places and have conversations that people ordinarily would be too afraid to go to.